Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave the air force chief of chaplains Chaplain Stephen A. Scheich will now deliver the invocation. I invite you to join me as I pray. Loving God, there is much we don't know about the firefight that took John Chapman's life on a snow-covered mountain 16 years ago. But this we do know. As Chappie walked through the valley of the shadow of death, he had no reason to fear evil, for you were right there with him. And like a good shepherd, your rod and your staff guided him. For in the presence of his enemies, you anointed his head with a calming oil. And the cup of his unflinching love of his brothers ran over. No doubt your goodness and mercy followed him all the days of his heroic life. And he dwells in your house forever. And so, God, we're not going to ask you to take away the lingering pain of John's death. That would serve only to dilute the love and respect we have for our esteemed brother. Rather, we ask that his example be our challenge to live like Terry's son did, to love like Val's husband did, and to serve others like Madison and Brianna's daddy did. May this ceremony, and even more, John Chapman's grit, guts, and gallantry inspire us all to make our lives matter, for this is our prayer. Amen. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Chief Khalif O. Wright. The ancient Greeks believed that character was formed in part by fate and in part by parental training. But it was exemplified not only by acts of bravery in battle, but in the habits of daily conduct. They must have had Technical Sergeant John Chapman in mind when they came up with this definition. So we're here today because of his actions on the battlefield on March the 4th, 2002. But I tell you, his character was formed some 36 years prior to this. John's childhood friends described him as worthy of this recognition because he was such a good person, extremely humble, compassionate, considerate, and always dedicated to helping others. It was John who intervened when one of his kindergarten friends was being bullied. It was John who consoled a elementary school classmate when she had lost her father. 
his mother Terry, and his late father Gene, they taught John the importance of hard work. He was a soccer player, but he was known early on to have two left feet. But he worked so hard and he practiced so much that he actually became a star because he never gave up. John approached soccer the way that he approached life. He got more satisfaction out of helping others than he did in scoring a goal for himself. He was competitive, he was aggressive, but he was humble. He carried that same humility into our United States Air Force. Retired Chief Master Sergeant Bruce Dixon, a teammate of his from the 24th Special Tactics Squadron, said John would have been embarrassed by the attention he is receiving now because it was never about him and always about his teammates. He recalled an exercise at Fort Bragg, training exercise known as the Monster Mash, up at 0300, find the objective, meet at the rally point. The last event was at the pool. Had to climb up 10 meters, dive into the pool, recover. Everybody died, dove and John was last. He got to the top and he did a half gainer somersault twisty, <laughs> split the water perfectly. Until then, no one knew that John had been a competitive diver, an Olympic hopeful, whose Connecticut state records still stand today. Because he never bragged about it, he never told anyone. John was full of life. He was full of enthusiasm. But above all, he was a devoted and compassionate father and husband who cared most about his wife, Valerie, and his daughters, Madison and Brianna. Valerie talked to me the other day about how John would come home from a deployment from a mission. She didn't know if he had killed 10 people or saved 10 people's lives. But when he walked through the door, he was a husband. He was a father. He loved giving uh, Madison and Brianna bath, and he scared the crap out of her when he tossed them onto the couch with the bath towel. Those who knew him knew that his greatest source of happiness and his ultimate success was being a husband and a father. Those who knew him also knew of his full measure of devotion to helping others. If given a chance, he would do anything in his power to help someone in need. So it's no surprise to any of us that the fourth, the fourth enlisted airman since, US, since the Air Force became its an independent service to be awarded this Congressional Medal of Honor. Because John died exactly the way he lived, doing anything in his power to help others in need. We're all very familiar with the events that took place atop the Afghan mountain. We lost seven men that day. Remaining true to John's character, he would want us to remember them all. Petty Officer First Class Neil Roberts, Army Sergeants Bradley Crows and Philip Zvitek, Army Corporal Matthew Cummins, Senior Airman Jason Cunningham, and Army Specialist Mark Anderson. Like each of us here today, the ancient Greeks would have been extremely proud of John Chapman. His character was exemplified in his daily conduct, but his acts of bravery in battle on the cold March morning in 2002 will forever speak to the man he really was. The man, the teammate, the operator, the American Airman. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, General David L. Goldfein. Thanks, Chief, not only for those words, but for the inspirational way you lead and represent our enlisted workforce. Of all the blessings I enjoy as Chief, working with you every day as my wingman ranks at the very top. So in a few moments, we'll hear the words of the citation that describe the actions on Takar Gar, where Tech Sergeant John Chapman fought to his death to protect his teammates. It's a story that will be told and retold for generations as the John Chapman story joins the ranks of other legends like John Levito and Bud Day and Leo Thorsness. And this week begins a year-long celebration of this incredible warrior who inspires all of us to be better airmen. So I'm going to spend a few moments talking like the chief about John Chapman, the man, the father of Brianna and Madison, the husband of Valerie, the son of his beloved mother, Terry, and the brother of Tammy, Lori, and Kevin, the team guy known as a quiet jokester and a fearless warrior. Well, I never met John, I feel like I know him because his picture hangs in my office just as it has for the past two years, courtesy of my former exec, Brigadier General Wolf Davidson. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Brigadier General Wolf Davidson. At difficult times and when faced with hard decisions as the chief, I can look at that picture and find quiet strength in his strength. And I'm reminded that leading and representing airmen like John Chapman remains the honor of a lifetime. And Wolf shared the story of how John came to being deployed to Afghanistan in January of 2002. As one of the more experienced combat controllers, John was placed on alert after 9-11 with the Navy SEAL team led by then Senior Chief Slab Sabinski, a fellow Medal of Honor winner from the same mission. And the SEAL team was scheduled to go forward to Afghanistan, but John wasn't in the plan to accompany them. So it was on Christmas Day, 2001, that Brigadier General Davidson was in the office and John Chapman walked in and he told Wolf, sir, this is the best Navy SEAL team they have and they're about to head out. And because they'll get the hardest missions, they need the most experienced combat controller with them. And he told his boss with quiet but forceful determination, I need to go with them. And Wolf shared with me that there was this look in his eyes that portrayed that he needed to be there for a higher purpose. And his logic was sound. And by the end of the conversation, John Chapman was on the deployment. Here I am, Lord. Send me. On the mission prior to Takrgar, John and the team were working out of a safe house in Afghanistan where there was a family in the house and only one room with the heater in February was rather cold. And as the family was being shuffled into a room without heat, John stopped the movement and demanded that, he, that the young girl and her family, who happened to be the same age as his daughters at the time, be allowed to stay in the heated room. And while the local Afghan forces initially resisted, John was adamant, and he wrapped his arms around the little girl until they relented. The basic humanity 
establish a level rapport with this family that made the entire team feel safer. And you can see the warmth of this relationship in that photo. And just days later, he was fighting with a vengeance up a 28 degree slope, knee high in snow, in close quarters against a determined enemy. Perhaps, perhaps that's what distinguishes us as American warriors from others. We fight with a purpose and we go to war with our values. And not only was John Chapman a fearless warrior, he was an incredibly good man. Such is the nature of those who receive our nation's highest honor because they inspire us to become better men and women and to work every day to live up to their example. So I hope as the story of John Chapman is told over the years, we never lose touch with the story of John Chapman, the man, the husband of Valerie, the father of Brianna and Madison, the son of Terry and the brother of Tammy, Lori and Kevin. And while this picture will eventually go back to Brigadier General Davidson where it belongs, Wolf, I'd be honored if I could keep it for a couple more years because Chappie and I have more work to do. And I can't imagine a day without him watching over me. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary of the United States Air Force, Secretary Wilson. Thank all of you for being here today. A particular thank you to Harvey Barnum, Medal of Honor recipient, Corey Echtberger, the father of Chief Master Sergeant Richard Eckberger, who was a Medal of Honor recipient, and of course to John's family, especially his mom, Terry, his widow, Val, and his daughters, Brianna and Madison. It's been wonderful to spend some time with all of you over the last few days. You know, we don't focus on it very much, but the first verse of our national anthem, which we just heard so beautifully sung, is a series of questions. Can you see our flag as the dawn is breaking? It was 1814, and Francis Scott Key, an American lawyer, was aboard the flagship of the British fleet in Baltimore Harbor as the British relentlessly pummeled Fort McHenry. It was a tough time in our history. Washington, D.C., the capital of this young republic, had been sacked by the British a few weeks before. The capital had been set aflame, and the White House was evacuated. That first verse ends with a question for us, a challenge. Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave for the land of the free and the home of the brave? Would our nation endure? Would we be protected by the brave? Would we be able to produce the men and women it takes, who swallow fear, who summon bravery, and act to protect freedom and to protect each other. Today, we honor John Chapman, who by his actions answered the question in our national anthem for his generation. He will forever be in our hall of heroes as one of America's bravest. 
When Neil Roberts was knocked off the back of his helicopter on March 4, 2002, John knew his only acceptable option was to go back for Neil. He knew they were flying into a hornet's nest, and he did it anyway. When the helicopter landed, John immediately moved toward the enemy, uphill, through knee-deep snow, under heavy fire. He knew what he was facing, and he did it anyway. He charged an enemy bunker, cleared it, exposed himself to attack, going after another bunker, was hit and knocked unconscious. When he regained consciousness, he knew he had to fight on, and he certainly knew the odds, and he did it anyway. Dawn was breaking over Tacker Gar. When the helicopter sent to rescue the team was about to be attacked by a fighter with a rocket propelled grenade, John knew he had to try to stop him. He was alone, outgunned, and he did it anyway. We could see the rocket's red glare, not from a ship in the harbor, but from the eyes of a predator drone arching overhead. To be sure, John's bravery that day wasn't some fluke. He had prepared himself for that day. Many of you in this room helped to train him for that day. One of John's instructors recalled Sergeant Chapman's time at the Combat Control School, one of the more grueling of Air Force training programs. In the Special tra Tactics Training Pipeline, about 85% wash out. And his instructor recalls a smirk on Sergeant Chapman's face during training as if the training was too easy for him. And his instructor says, it was too easy for John. John Chapman never talked about how good he was at what he did. He didn't have to. You know, we don't often sing the three final verses in our national anthem. In the final one, Francis Scott Key answers his own question with something of a prayer that praises the power that hath made a, and preserves us a nation. The Star Spangled Banner in triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. For his generation of Americans. John Chapman was the answer to that lingering question. Our nation endures and continues to be the land of the free because of brave men, because of John Chapman. General Goldfein, Chief Wright, and Ms. Valerie Nessel, the widow of Technical Sergeant John A. Chapman, will now join Secretary Wilson on stage for the induction ceremony. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated during the presentations. The President of the United States of America, Authorized by Act of Congress, March 3, 1863, 
has awarded in the name of the Congress the Medal of Honor to Technical Sergeant John A. Chapman for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of life above and beyond the call of duty. Technical Sergeant John A. Chapman distinguished himself by extraordinary heroism as a combat controller attached to a Navy sea, air, and land team conducting reconnaissance operations in Takur Gar, Afghanistan on 4 March 2002. During insertion, the team's helicopter was ambushed, causing a teammate to fall into a hornet's nest of enemy below. Sergeant Chapman and the SEALs voluntarily reinserted onto a snow-capped mountain into the heart of a known enemy stronghold to rescue one of their own. Sergeant Chapman immediately engaged, moving in the direction of the closest enemy position, despite coming under heavy fire from multiple directions. He charged an enemy bunker up a 15-degree grade in thigh-deep snow, directly into the hostile fire. Upon reaching the bunker, Sergeant Chapman assaulted through and cleared the position, killing all enemy occupants. With complete disregard for his own life, Sergeant Chapman deliberately moved from cover and exposed himself once again to intense enemy fire to attack a second bunker with an emplaced machine gun that was firing on the team. Emerging from the bunker less than 12 meters from the enemy and directly in the line of fire, Sergeant Chapman attacked the machine gun emplacement from an exposed position. During this assault, Sergeant Chapman was struck and injured by enemy fire. Despite severe wounds, he continued to fight relentlessly, sustaining a violent engagement with multiple enemy personnel before paying the ultimate sacrifice. In the conduct of these heroic actions, Sergeant Chapman is credited with saving the lives of his teammates. By his courageous actions and extraordinary valor at the cost of his own life, Technical Sergeant Chapman upheld the highest traditions of military service and reflected great credit upon himself and the United States Air Force. At this time, the Medal of Honor flag will be presented to Ms. Valerie Nessel. On 23 October 2002, Public Law 107-248, Section 8143, established the Medal of Honor flag to recognize service members who have distinguished themselves by gallantry in action above and beyond the call of duty. The Medal of Honor flag commemorates the sacrifice and bloodshed for our freedoms and gives emphasis to the Medal of Honor being the highest award for valor by an individual serving in the armed forces of the United States. The light blue color with gold fringe bearing 13 white stars are adapted from the Medal of Honor ribbon. Ladies and gentlemen, the Medal of Honor plaque will now be unveiled, inducting Technical Sergeant Chapman into the Hall of Heroes. Ladies and gentlemen, Sergeant Chapman's mother, Mrs. Teresa Chapman, and his sister, Mrs. Lori Longfritz.
Good morning, Madam Secretary, General Goldfein, Chief Wright, and all you wonderful people from the Air Force, ladies and gentlemen, all of Johnny's friends. I didn't prepare a speech because I knew I would get like this. Not, the words wouldn't come out. I could go on here and tell you all kinds of stories about John, but I don't have to. I think you already know what he was like. And I'm ever so grateful those who worked so hard to make this possible. I can't tell you how much it means to me and my family. Thank you so much. I prepared a few just little notes just to kind of keep me moving along. Um, I thought I would keep it short, but then I was told that I have all the time in the world, so how much time do you guys have? Because <laughs> when I'm talking about John, I can talk for five minutes or five hours, or five days if you give it to me. Um, pardon? Oh, I see your face. <laughs> First, I would like to thank all of you for coming. Um, I'm afraid that I'm going to forget someone, I'm afraid to, that I'm going to forget to thank someone who requires, who needs, who deserves to be thanked. So I, I think I'm just going to leave it at a blanket thank you for being here. Um, but I, I guess I'm not going to leave it there because there are certain people who, I want to thank former Secretary of the Air Force, Deborah James, for asking the question, what does it take for an airman to receive the Medal of Honor? I would like to thank all the people who worked to find that answer for her, including Wolf, where's Wolf? Mike Martin, General Goldfein, where is Mike Wendelkin? Thank you, Mike. Every single one of you are very humble. I thank you, and you say, I, I didn't really do anything. You, you have done a lot. Um, I want to thank everyone else who's here supporting us and supporting John, wanting to honor him. Um, for those of you who want to hear me talk for days about John Simulator. <laughs> I can. Um, when I think back about growing up with John, it, it, there are four of us kids, but we were so close in age that it feels like it's always been the four of us. All for one, one for all. We fought, we laughed, we cried, always together. Or, well, maybe sometimes it was the boys against the girls or the oldest and the youngest against the middle kids, but we always came together when it was needed. Um, growing up with Kevin and John and Tammy uh, was wonderful. Growing up in Windsor Locks is a wonderful little town that's all about family. But you guys came here to listen to hear about John, so I'll move on from that. Um, there's this quote in a, a book, To Kill a Mockingbird, you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. Well, that couldn't be further from the truth. John chose all of his family, and that includes people who are not blood-related. Um, starting in, as a child, he chose his friends well. He didn't, he was friendly with everyone, but he chose, he was very careful in choosing those who he brought into his inner circle. And each one of those people that he brought in helped form him. He, he, had the, he had the 
beginnings of it, but every person that came into his life affected him as he affected them. As he grew older, high school, going into the military, he did the same. He was respectful of everyone, I think. Um, maybe some people would have a, something to say about that. But the people he chose to stay, to keep close to him, are very special people. Uh, one second. He chose Valerie. He wanted her. He made that choice, and it was a wonderful choice. He and Valerie together chose to have Madison and Brianna. He loved all three of them more than anything. There's a saying, um, my son John went to Jim Kelly's football camp a couple years ago. Go Bills! <laughs> <laughs> and Jim Kelly is all about respect, calling people yes sir, no, no ma'am. And every year he has a, a saying on the back of the shirts that get handed out. And the year that John went, it said, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And that's true, especially of John, my brother John. Look at his friends. Look at the family that he chose. And you can see how he was the, the person that he, he, who did what he did on that mountain. He, John was the type of person from the time he was a little boy till the time he died to do the right thing because it was the right thing, even if no one was watching. He wasn't perfect. He was a stinker. He was a little mischievous. He was a very calculated risk taker. Uh, if he would kind of weigh the odds, if I do this, what, what's the worst that could happen? I can handle that, I'm gonna do it. And he would. And half the time he got away with it. <laughs> I'll tell you one story. It's a quick one. And, and this was, mom would send him to his room if he did something wrong. And I think this only happened a couple of times. But his room had a lower window than the rest of, of than my sister and I. So he would, she, he'd get sent to the, his room. Mom would go about her business. John would climb out the window and go play in the neighborhood. <laughs> she, he'd climb back in, in time, I don't know how he knew, but every, he never got caught. If I got out, I, I'd get caught in five minutes, but that, he never got caught. And so, yeah, he weighed the risk. What's the worst he could do, get, have happen to him, get stuck in his room? I mean, <laughs> John had an uncanny way of making anyone, if he met you for five minutes or he knew you for a lifetime, if you were with him, in front of him, next to him, he made you feel like you were the most important person at that moment in time to him. It was uncanny. My son played football. He had a favorite coach last year that he's been kept in contact with. Uh, coach Thompson allowed him to practice with them to get ready for junior high football. John told Coach Thompson about his uncle. Then Coach Thompson told his team the, about John Chapman. And he said, after telling the brief story, he said that just as John Chapman did, his team needs to play to the whistle. John played to the whistle every time, especially on March 4th, 2002. I want to read a quote that um, my husband Kenny told me about. Um, I'm, I'm bringing in another Bill's reference, I'm sorry. <laughs> Marv Levy had heard this, it, it's a very long ballad, a poem, a ballad of Sir Andrew Barton 
a Scottish sailor from Leith. I'm assuming that's Leith, Scotland. Um, this is a, a part of the poem that struck him, and I believe it really fits here also. Let me put my glasses on. Fight on, my men. I am hurt, but I am not slain. I'll lay me down and bleed a while, and then I'll rise and fight again. And that's exactly what John did on that day. In that last hour of John, John's life on that mountain, people can say, well, he had no choice. He had to fight. Yeah, he did have to fight. It was fight or die. But he took that fight to them. He owned that fight. He didn't just sit back and wait for something to help him. He helped himself. He brought it to them. And there was no way that he was going to retreat. He did it his way, the way he did, lived his life from the time he was small to the time he died. He lived his life his way, and he fought that fight his way. And I couldn't be happier and more proud of him. I think I can't talk anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, the men and women of the United States Air Force are proud to induct Technical Sergeant Chapman into the Hall of Heroes. A reception will follow in the hallway at the entrance of the auditorium. Please remain standing for the playing of the Air Force song. This concludes today's ceremony. Thank you for attending and we wish you a pleasant day.